I will now present and explain the direct algebraic definition of the determinant. In order to follow this presentation, you will have to understand permutations and their parity. And let me also remind you of the angle we're coming from. Until now, we've been deriving the expressions for determinants of small matrices based on this property right here. And here are the expressions we came up with. Here is the one by one, the two by two, the three by three, and the four by four determinants. Now, based on these expressions, we're going to postulate or guess, if you will, this algebraic definition. And then we'll go from this definition to the properties of the determinant. So let's get started. Now, in order to make the pattern that's emerging from the available expressions clearer, let's switch from denoting the entries of the matrix by different letters to denoting them by the same letter A and letting a pair of subscripts indicate the entry's position in the matrix. By convention, the first subscript indicates the row and the second subscript indicates the column. So a 3 by 3 matrix becomes this. And pay attention to the order in which I'm writing the subscripts. I hope it was helpful to watch that matrix unfold. And I also think it'll be helpful to hear the entries of the matrix read out loud. So let's go row by row. We have A11, A12, A13, A21, A22, A23, and A31, A32, A33. So when you hear of the entry A23, you immediately know that it's the entry in row 2 and column 3. Or in a larger matrix, if you hear A712, you know that it's the entry in the 7th row and the 12th column. Now let me write down the determinant of this matrix using these new symbols. And once again, pay attention to the order in which I write the subscript. And I believe the pattern summarized by this definition will begin to emerge. Okay, I will leave it up to you to make sure that this expression is correct. I recommend thinking back to the Russian way of calculating 3 by 3 determinants and verifying that these terms correspond to the correct 6 patterns. Okay, now it's time to take a step back and to summarize what we're seeing. We have 6 terms, each a product of 3 entries, one from each row, and one from each column. And the rows always come in order in each term. If I were to name the first subscript in each term, it would sound like a waltz. It would go 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. All right, what about the columns? Well, the columns are totally different. The columns are completely scrambled, except in the first term. The columns correspond to permutations. And that's why we have six terms, because there are six possible permutations of numbers 1, 2, and 3. Let me write each of the permutations down. And I think you should do the same. You should pause the video, write down all the possible permutations of numbers 1, 2, and 3, find a system for doing that, and then come back and check with us. All right, there you have it. And now you see how there is one term corresponding to each of the permutations. You just look at the columns. We have one, two, three. So in the first term, the columns go one, two, three. One, three, two, one, three, two. 
two, one, three, two, one, three, and so forth. And you can see how I was very systematic about this approach. First, I did the terms with ones in the first place, then with twos, then with threes. And in higher dimensions, it would be a much longer list. Okay, now we understand the terms. The only thing that's left is the sign. And the sign is very simple. It corresponds to the parity of the permutation. If the permutation is even, it's a plus. If the permutation is odd, it's a minus. So let's see what we have for these permutations. One, two, three is an even permutation, so there is a plus. One, three, two is a single switch away from one, two, three. An odd number of switches, one switch. So it's an odd permutation, so there is a minus. Two, one, three is also a single switch from one, two, three. It's an odd permutation, so it's a minus. Two, three, one is two switches away from one, two, three. First, we have to swap one and three, and then one and two. And we'll have one, two, three, two switches, and therefore it's a plus. Let's complete the two remaining ones. We have three, one, two. It's one switch to put the one here, and then the other switch to put two and three in their places, so it's a plus. And finally, this one is a single switch, swap one and three away from one, two, three. So it's an odd permutation, and there is a minus. So the sign is determined by the parity of the permutation. So it's a plus if it's an even permutation and minus if it's an odd permutation. That's actually called the sign of the permutation or the signature of the permutation. You can say that the sign of the permutation is one when it's an even permutation and minus one when it's an odd permutation. And this completes the statement of the formula for three by three matrices. I will now repeat the exact same thing, but I will use words that apply to matrices of arbitrary size. And that will pretty much spell out this formula. Let's see. In the case of an n by n matrix, we'll have a sum of n factorial terms, one for each permutation, and epsilon denotes the permutation. Each term will be a product of n entries, one from each row, and one from each column. The rows will come in order. They'll go one, two, three, and so forth all the way to n. The columns will correspond to permutations. That's why I have epsilon of one, epsilon of two, and so forth, epsilon of n. Because epsilon of one determines the first number in the permutation epsilon. This is the second number, and this is the nth number. So you can see how this is a straightforward generalization of what we saw in the case of three by three matrices. And finally, the last element is the sign. And it's the sign of the permutation. I've already said it several times. Let me say it one more time. It's a plus if it's an even permutation, and it's a minus if it's an odd permutation. So there you go. That's the general definition. Let me show you on the screen what this definition results in for four by four matrices. And you can make sure for yourself that each of the terms conforms to this pattern and comes with the right sign. And finally, a short illustration for five by five determinants. We're going to look at a single term that I marked on the board out of 120. And you can see how I selected the entries. So there is exactly one in each row and exactly one in each column. And there are 119 other ways of doing this, corresponding to the other 119 terms in the sum. This one corresponds to the permutation two, three, five, four, one. And so it's the term A, one, two, A, two, three, a, three, five, A, four, four, and A, five, one. And the only remaining question for this term is whether it comes with a plus or a minus. So what's the parity of this permutation? All right, let's see. How many swaps 
do we need to make in order to arrive at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5? Let's see, it would take 1, 2, 3, 4 swaps for the 1 to arrive at its rightful place. That would put the 2 where it belongs, the 3 where it belongs, and the only remaining swap would be the 4 and the 5. And so there's a total of 5 swaps, 4 to bring the 1 here, and then swap the 4 and the 5. 5 is an odd number, so this term comes with a minus sign. So to calculate the entire 5 by 5 determinant for a generic matrix, all you have to do is do this another 119 times. Of course, no one would do that, and that's why there are other ways of calculating determinants. This was only for illustration purposes. And so, that's the direct algebraic definition of the determinant. Some people may call it long and complicated, I call it elegant.